Um, so location index is the project that I'll be talking about today. I think this has been presented previously, but more from a kind of higher level. I'm going to be going through um, more from a product uh, kind of description, what you can do with it, um, some future directions, uh, technical architectures, all that kind of stuff. Essentially, what we're trying to do is enable data integration via linking location data. And I'll go through what I mean by that um, in a little while. Uh, this is a project um, that's been um, a partnership of, uh, between the ABS, uh, Geoscience Australia, uh, Department of Ag, Water and Environment, and CSIRO um, as part of the uh, DIPA program, uh, Data Integration Partners for Australia, uh, as part of the Commonwealth Government um, Initiative. So the, the, the kind of question that we try to tackle uh, in this project was connecting up location data um, and as you can see in the next slide here, this, this graphic, this image that we've been, uh, I guess, captures what we're trying to do is, or, um, is, is to integ integrate between different sorts of data across um, different data holdings. Um, particularly um, in Commonwealth government, there's quite a lot of data being captured in different aspects. So you can see you know, from societal aspects to the economy, to the environment, there's all these different um, data sources um, uh, being being captured um, that typically geocode um, the data, whether it's in geospatial formats or in traditional databases or data warehouses. Um, all of these data sets that you can see here from census to health to business activities to weather climate um, have some location uh, embedded within it. Now, the problem is if you've got one geography, you want to translate that to another geography, um, you need specialist expertise or um, you have to somehow convert data. Um, and this has been kind of a barrier between, a uh, barrier for um, data analysts um, in Commonwealth government and, and in the private sector. Um, and often you compromise the, the modeling because you've got to make some assumptions. Um, we're trying to bring together gridded address data um, and um, vector data as well. So that, 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 that's kind of a, a feature of Loki. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, location is, is the, the thing that is gonna bring all of these things together. Um, and the, the couple of things that we wanted to um, propose is have consistent identifiers for spatial things. Um, we need to be able to link locations and observations. So if you have a database of um, socioeconomic data, you need a way to link your location with the observations using these consistent identifiers. Um, and, and by consistent identifiers, I mean globally consistent identifiers for the spatial things. Um, we need to be able to assemble differently referenced geographies, uh, whether it's vector or gridded, um, and whether it's different geographies, we need to be able to make sense of them um, and crosswalk them. Um, and, and so part of the Loki project was also looking at um, the user archetypes and the, the types of users that would use this sort of approach or this system. Um, and there was quite a bit of interviews done uh, to elicit this, um, this set of users. So we've got, um, I guess, data analysts and GIS analysts and um, people who broker um, between these people um, on the right-hand side, and they typically develop information products. Um, you've got these enterprise data warehouse um, archetypes that um, manage the systems that provide the data to these groups. And that's important because um, if we're going to propose a new way of um, managing and accessing location data, then these people are going to be key in um, allowing that data prep uh, to the users um, in the data warehouses that, you know, um, are within different agencies and companies and um, groups. 
there was this extra layer here because this was a Dipper project. Um, uh, there's the ABS data lab, which um, has this big data analytics capability. They have fine grained information and um, privacy sensitive data. Um, and they want to be able to uh, integrate location as well. Um, and that was one of the primary drivers for this project is to allow them to do um, data ag aggregation from um, unit level records um, into different reporting regions. So that was uh, one of the key things there. So speaking to this group of um, geospatial experts, um, I guess you might have a question, you know, why can't we, can't, can't we do this already? Um, and to a certain extent, I think we can do this already, but um, there are a couple of problems. Uh, firstly, we've got um, not so much a geospatial problem, but an identity problem. So you might publish um, geospatial data, but might use the same identifier as another geography. Um, and if you're faced with the identifiers, but um, they have that are the same, but have different features, um, you've got to do some disambiguation. Um, sometimes you'll have, um, mul so sometimes you'll have multiple features with the same identifier. Sometimes you'll have the same identifier um, for multiple features. Um, so you kind of get different sorts of identity problems prop up. Um, once you start to integrate these, these data sets together. Um, sometimes they don't line up. So you might have the same ident identifier, but they're kind of slightly different. Um, and so there's a question about which one's the authoritative one or what processes was done to this one to get this result. Um, and when you're integrating data, that, that, that is a problem that you have to resolve. Um, yep, get more of that. Um, so the traditional solution is to delegate it all to the um, GIS expert. Um, so you get them uh, to calculate the relationships and get the answers. Um, but that requires um, the GIS tools and expertise um, and the know-how to operate these tools. Um, and depending on the different um, uh, person you give it to, the outputs may vary, um, you know, different approaches to um, resolve data issues, right? So the Loki approach is to try to um, do a couple of things. Firstly, is to standardize the location identifier. So instead of having the identifiers locally identified in a geo package or a shapefile or whatever it is, um, we want to publish those, that location information using reliable and consistent web identifiers. Um, and we're, we're strongly proposing a um, linked data approach here where everything um, is published by the web um, using the protocols established by the web to identify, uniquely identify things. So you can see here that um, I've got an example of two geospatial features that have been um, created in Loki and given a name. So this is the identifier that's globally unique. Um, and the naming structure is important as well. And I won't go into that um, at this point, but uh, suffice to say that um, if I click on this link, um, if my, will my browser fire up? Yep, there you go. Um, it, it gives me a landing page with that feature. Um, this is somewhere in ACT with some metadata and other ways of getting at um, different um, machine readable and um, you know, other, other views of the data. So I can start doing some machine processing on that um, uh, as well as you know, get um, the actual data. So go back to my talk. Um, so, uh, so publishing these on the web is one of the features of Loki. Um, and so we want to do that for every data set. And I've shown you know, two data sets here, two features. The second thing we want to do is standardize the linkages because um, the links between 
different features or geographies is important in order to do data integration. So if I want to go from an ASGS statistical area level two, which is a which is an ABS product, to a geofabric contractor catchment on the right, which is a Bureau of Met um, product. Um, typically, I'd need to do that GIS operation in my desktop GIS. Um, what we've done in Loki is we've pre-calculated that and published that and described that using um, standard semantics using GeoSparkle. So what we're saying here is that this statistical area level two is within this contractor catchment feature and you don't have to use the GIS as you as the user um, of Loki, you don't have to use a GIS to understand that that is a link. Um, just querying Loki will provide you that, um, that answer in a consistent way. So if multiple users hit the API, they get the same answer. Um, and so, yeah, as I mentioned, every data set gets a um, set of web identifiers um, and these then get published on the web. And you can see if you have a thing with a link to another thing and many things, you start to get a network or a graph, um, a data graph. Um, so um, that, that's a feature. Um, as I also mentioned, there are APIs that provide GIS-like operations without the need for desktop GIS tools. So I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a little while. Um, okay, so I'll just go to some demos just to illustrate um, what I mean. Uh, let me see. Okay, go back to this browser. Um, so the first demo is um, the Loki Explorer. So what this is, is um, it's, it's an explorer of what's available in Loki. So I can do a text search, for example, for Acton, uh, which was that area in, um, in uh, uh, that I showed earlier. Um, and I can you know, get information about Acton via text search or I can drop a pin uh, somewhere along, oh, that's a different actin. Um, well, let's see if we can find the actual actin. Um, there we go. Uh, we can drop a pin, uh, the zooming's not working, sorry. That's a little bit of a bug, but um, I have dropped the pin there, it just zoomed somewhere else. Um, uh, yep, so I've got actin, well, I've got the pin where I think actin is. And then on the right hand side, it shows me the results of that um, uh, of, of features that intersect with that point. So I can go, well, show me the drainage division. It's going to be a little bit big. Um, or show me the statistical area level one um, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's quite a few results that, that are on the right hand side here. I can page through them if I want and get all different kinds. Um, and it's telling me that there is this feature called mesh block that um, 8000510000 that intersects with this point. Um, and I can get more information about that either in this explorer or um, hitting this link to that, um, that mesh block. So that's the mesh block there. Um, I can view that information here and it pulls in metadata from, um, from actually that page um, to, to display here. You can see there's an identifier a local identifier um, and a link to a geometry. So I can follow that link to the, where that geometry is hosted. And we've got a service that hosts all the geometries for Loki um, in, our, in our system. So this is the geometry view. Um, I'll just pause here about the geometry. Um, here we've got a geometry data service that provides just the geometry. Um, and I can do things like um, give me the GeoJSON uh, which might be handy. Um, give me the WKT, which might be also handy for different, um, different clients. There's this thing called an alternates view and I can get things like the centroid view. So, you know, um, if I just wanted a centroid, I can, I can do that um, without having to do any, you know, desktop GIS operations, just specifying the view that I want as a centroid. Um, so just go back. Um, 
here I can see a little bit of a, a graph and I'll just explain what this is. Is so we're viewing the feature, um, this mesh block, um, and there's two groups of relationships here. Um, one that's a contains relationship. Let's see if I can deselect that. Um, and one that's a within relationship. And so what this is saying is that for this feature, uh, this mesh block, um, you can navigate to things that it contains. So it could be an address. Um, you can see here in the, in the highlighted box there. Um, or you can um, navigate to things that it's within. Um, and you can see here that it's within a statistical area level three, um, remote area, remoteness areas, and all these other features. Um, and that's because we've pre-calculated that, that spatial relationship to other features. Um, so now we can navigate to any one of these things um, via this interface or via the API. Um, so this is showing you the remoteness area. Um, I think because remoteness area is big, it's pulling in the geometry, so it won't update until it gets the geometry. But so, so that's the Explorer. Um, it, it sort of highlights what you can do with the API. There are some useful operations that you can do in this site, um, but really it's, it's to highlight that you can grab information from the API um, in these various ways um, and then start to do different operations with it. And I'll show, I'll show a little bit down the track as well. Um, so that's, oops, sorry, that's Explorer. Um, it's available at explorer.loki.cat. Um, the second tool that I'd like to demo is the data reapportionment tool called Accelerator. Um, and there's no mistake in the name. Um, that's because what we wanted to do was allow data analysts who deal with CSVs and Excel files. Much of the data is published in Excel files that have geocoded um, identifiers. So for example, here I've shown um, the census data for uh, population and housing. If you go to this site, you you can download um, the data as a as a CSV file. Um, and so, a lot of the analysis, well, a lot of the studies that we, the user study that was carried out showed that um, many policy analysts and data analysts in government use this sort of format to do geospatial and want to do geospatial um, re-aggregation or um, transformations. Um, and so we've, we've built um, a tool that uses Loki to do that. Since we have globally identified spatial things and the linkages between different geographies, um, this allows us to use the API to transform that um, using Accelerator. Um, so conceptually, what we're seeing is, what we'll see is that um, we have data sets here on the left here um, encoded as mesh blocks, ASGS 2016 mesh blocks with some observation data. So it could be dwelling counts. Um, and we wanna transform that into another geography, for example, the geofabric contractor catchment. Um, now I've loaded an example here of what it might look like um, a cut down version, perhaps. So in this Excel file, we've got, um, you know, the, the geo, the, the location, the mesh block code, um, and we've got a dwelling count. So we've got about 25 of these or so, 27. Um, and I'll just go to the accelerator site. So what you can do, typically you'd load up a GIS um, and you'd load, you know, the mesh block layer, you'd load the geofabric layer, you'd um, load the, the CSV as a, another kind of layer and try to integrate um, the lot. Um, I've done some previously, so just testing. Um, and so what we're, what we're showing, we're gonna show here is that using this interface, this web interface, you don't have to install any programs, go to this website. Um, I've got this data here, um, same data, it's called mesh dwellings, mesh blocks. And I can drag and drop that CSV into this, um, this, this site. Um, now it doesn't know, so it's asking me um, what I want from, so as in the geography. 
Um, and then there's the two. So I have to select um, mesh block because the data set is in 20, ASGS 2016 mesh block. And then I can transform that into any, any of the matching ones that a mesh block can transform into. So um, I wanted to do contracted catchment. So there's geofabric stuff, yeah, but there's also other ASGS ones that I could transform that to. So I'll just do that there. Um, and the feature of this site is that you can, um, you kind of queues, so you can load in as many as you want and do all these different transformations if you want to. I might do it to SA2, I might do a mesh block to, I don't know, river region, that's, that's probably enough. Um, so just downloading that result and viewing it, what I get back is um, a converted data set. So it was mesh block. Now it's in contracted catchment and it's embedded the Loki identifier. So, um, you know, any other data set that, that uses this down the track can then, you know, understand what, what a 12100615 is. Um, so if I click on this link, it will take me to the landing page for the contractor catchment. Um, and I can get the, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right, close that message. Um, I can get the feature information. Yeah, let me reload that page because that thing was loading, hopefully. Um, it's got the metadata. Uh, yep, there you go, got it that time. Um, and again, it's a landing page, um, which you can then get different views and different formats out of, out of it. Um, I suppose one thing to note here is that I can then um, use that file um, that I've downloaded because it's geocoded for um, uh, contracted catchments, loading that converted file in, it, it reads the file and it understands that it's contracted catchment and then I can go Maybe I want to go back to mesh blocks, right? So I can go that way as well. Um, uh, so yeah, this is this is kind of supporting the use case for um, uh, data analysts dealing with CSV files. All right. Um, any questions so far? Happy to pause. If not, I will keep going. All right, I'll keep going then. Um, yeah, this is just showing conceptually what's happening. So you've got geocoded uh, locations and then you can transform that to other features. And then um, what you can do then is integrate that with other data. So say I've got, you know, hydrological data in, you know, in the contract, the geofabric, um, I can then easily intersect that and do some analysis. Uh, not yet. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to show was, so, so we've got the simple use cases. We've got the accelerator. Um, we've got Explorer, which allows you to kind of um, view different things and get different um, identifiers out of the system. Um, uh, so these are fairly simple, but I guess depending on the use case um, will be quite, quite powerful. Um, we also wanted to um, show some of the Jupyter Notebooks, the data science, um, I guess, environments that, um, uh, that, that the API allows interaction with. So we've got a bunch of data science notebooks on GitHub. Um, I've put the link in, in the presentation here. Um, so, you know, you can go, go here and see all the different um, notebooks that we have on, um, that interact with the API. Um, so I'll just demonstrate a couple. So I've got one that I did recently um, looking at COVID-19 data. So um, I think in a, about July, DHHS was publishing their data on, on their website as a CSV. Um, so kind of a thought experiment was, can we load this into Loki and visualize it um, easily? So this notebook describes how to do that. So I'm loading the data here. Um, uh, so we've got those cases and then there's a bit of Python coding to get um, things working here. 
but once you've got that code, um, you can basically bring that CSV to life um, without having to fire up a desktop GIS or without having to load spatial layers into this environment. This is just querying the Loki uh, infrastructure to get um, uh, this, this, you know, the LGA data. And then we can use py standard Python tools to, to color, um, color code the regions with the different um, uh, numbers. So, um, so yeah, this is just a quick demonstrator of how you could use um, Loki to power this sort of visualization. You can imagine any other LGA kind of data being, being inserted into here. Um, and once you've got the notebook, you can basically interchange the data and get this visualization quickly. Um, the second example here is um, we can, because we've got the GNF addresses in Loki, we can plot the addresses for um, different features. Uh, so this notebook shows you how to plot addresses from GNF um, for any given ASGS mesh, mesh block. Um, and this is an interactive version. Um, so once you get past the, the code there, um, there is a text field here. And this text field allows you to enter in a mesh block identifier, um, a low key mesh block identifier. So I've loaded one in from, uh, what is it? If I just go to this uh, somewhere in Canberra. Yep. Um, so I don't know. Let's go to the Explorer and see, you know, where else we might do that. Um, so say, say I was in, wanted to get um, addresses. I don't know. I'll drop a pin somewhere here. Uh, where did, why does it keep doing that? It's a bit of a bug. Sorry. Live demos. Um, somewhere in Essendon North. Um, so I'll look for the mesh block. Um, where is it? Here. So there's a mesh block here. It's oh, a bit funny. Um, anyway, we'll just get this uh, link address and pop it into our um, text field here. And there it should. Yeah, so um, there's a progress bar showing you that um, querying the Loki um, infrastructure is gotten 47 addresses. And so it's it's loading all of that information in um, here, um, processing each one of them, and then it will visualize it in this in this notebook. Um, so five seconds to go. Um, so we're not loading GNF into a GIS. Um, it's already pre-cached in the Loki infrastructure. We're not loading um, G uh, ASGS layers. Uh, going to come? Maybe not. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. Now I'm not sure what this is, but anyway, <laughs> um, for some reason it's decided to get this, this dot here. I don't know why. Oh, there you go. Um, so yeah, the, the point is you can put any mesh block here and get addresses. Um, I'll go to another example. So this other example is um, doing that reapportioning um, use case. So using this notebook, I can take a contractor catchment and reapportion data as from a contractor catchment CSV to ASGS mesh blocks. So, um, you know, if you wanted to transform data in one into the other, this might be a way of doing that. Um, I'll jump to the last um, Jupyter notebook, which um, is it going to let me? Um, and, and, oh, sorry, there was another one as well, but uh, we might have run out of time around DGGS. Um, so if, if we've got time, we can, we can look at that. Um, I wanted to also show, um, a, a notebook, um, demonstrating how we can integrate, um, geospatial big data pipelines, um, with Loki. So um, got a couple of examples here of using the open data cube. 
uh, which is a product that's uh, being developed by GA and CSRO and it's being adopted um, and deployed in different uh, countries. Um, so um, I've got two products here. One is a Landsat 8 fractional cover um, product. Um, and this notebook here, um, we're tinkering with it. And um, this shows how you can, um, uh, well, we're listing a few Loki identifiers here, um, LGAs. And what we're doing is we're trying to intersect for an LGA, give me the remote sense data. So this fractional cover data has, um, so that's the Loki, that's the Loki feature, the LGA feature. Um, this, this remote sense data has um, vegetation information. So uh, we've pulled in remote sensing data from the Landsat uh, data set for, for the area, which was the, which I showed, which was the Barossa Valley, Barossa Valley area. Um, and it's showing a amount of green vegetation. So this is a remote sense product showing you green vegetation. Um, and this notebook shows how we can um, intersect, well, cookie cut um, this remote sense data, uh, which is gig gigabytes big um, in a data cube, um, and plot that um, for that LGA. So say I wanted to know how much vegetation is in the Barossa Valley uh, for a given time using this remote sense product. Um, Traditionally, I'd have to load in this uh, geospatial layer, right, and of the remote sense data here. But um, in this notebook, we're showing we can use the APIs to do that job. Um, and there's quite a few powerful um, Python libraries out there um, that allow you to do things like um, drill into the data to get different time slices. So this is showing you um, uh, the 13th of February, 2018, um, and you know. You're just using the slider here, we can page through different days um, and quite easily get a visual representation of, you know, the Barossa Valley at, you know, August um, or at uh, March, uh, February 3rd, right? Um, and we can also do things like statistical, um, you know, summaries. Um, so, kind of brings the intersection of um, uh, um, authoritative data, authoritative geospatial location data with remote sense data, which could be anywhere on, on the earth. Um, and, you know, we can show that we can easily go from Barossa Valley to the Yarra Ranges, for example, right? So, you know, I can, I can run the rest of this um, For, for that as well. Um, and if I swap that Landsat data for um, the WAFS data set, which is the water observations from space, suddenly I've got a, you know, um, a water oriented data set pipeline. Um, and similar thing, I can use Loki to pull in the feature, I can pull in the um, remote sense data, I can then, you know, map that um, and page through the different data, data points in time. Um, yeah, and this is just showing whether something is wet or not. So there are certain parts in the Barossa Valley that gets wet. wet. Um, how am I going for time, Kieran? Uh, pretty decent. If you're gonna go for another five minutes or so and then you might open up for questions. Okay. All right, uh, so I've got time for one more demonstrator, which is, um, so using, so something that the that Geoscience Australia has been working on is, is called the DGGS. I'm not sure if many people have heard uh, DGGS. Um, it's the discrete global grid system and there's an OSPIX product. So um, what this allows you to do, and, and there's been some work with the Loki team um, in collaboration with GA as well, um, to um, provide a pathway for integrating DGGS with Loki features. Um, so um, 
while this is running. Um, it allows you to, so what DGGS is, is a discrete global grid system where you can divide the earth into cells and then nest those cells within uh, more cells. Um, and so there's an infinite number of uh, nested cells that can be created. Um, each cell has an identifier. And so um, you can take something like this uh, spatial region, which is a map of uh, uh, outline of Black Mountain in Canberra um, and put it through the uh, DGGS OSPIX engine, which is the GA product um, and get a, um, an approximation based on this um, engine. It gives you the cells for this region that intersect. Um, and so you can go down you know, different different levels. Um, I've selected level 10, but you could go down finer resolution than that and, and it'll, it'll match, you know, more of these quant edge cases. Um, but using, but one of the things with Loki is we've got an API that allows you to find locations by, for a DGGS cell ID. So for each one of these cell IDs, we can get the intersecting um, authoritative Loki feature. And so what we can then do is um, ask things like, well, what is the feature, overarching feature for those DGGS cells? And, and this is the answer, it's Canberra, well, ACT. Um, but we can ask things like, give me the mesh block, give me the statistical area, give me the contractor catchment, all, all, the, all the features that we have in Loki, um, we, can, we can ask for the specific thing. Um, so this was a simple example. Um, We've got a more um, sophisticated example here um, where we're loading in um, a feature uh, a data set from the Department of Environment, it was called before then, but Department of Ag, Water and the Environment now. Um, so they publish, uh, I guess, um, maps around species of national environmental significance. Um, you can check out the data sets on their website. Um, and the GIS data. What we've done is we've just we've just pulled out um, one species, the Leadbed opossum, and um, mapped that in here. Just pulling that from you know the the we've created a GeoJSON file for that um, excerpt from that. Um, so that's showing that there. Now, I guess one question might be, well, can you tell me um, the LGAs that uh, that are affected by, um, that, that have the lead bed opossums, the critically endangered lead bed opossums. And so traditionally you'd have to fire up your GIS and do load in those layers and load in the, the, the lead bed opossum layer and do those intersects. Um, we've pre-calculated all of that in Loki. So we can then go, well, we can pre-calculate that in Loki and the DGGS and then give that answer. So this is using the DGGS engine to, and, what, what we call DGGS enable the data. So you can get the cells for the lead bed opossums. And then based on those cells, we can then crosswalk to find the matching LGAs. Um, so this is showing the LGAs that um, overlap, intersect with those DGGS cells. Um, we can do the same for ABS statistical areas as well, which is still, is still processing, but um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pipeline for taking, I guess, any arbitrary feature, uh, geospatial feature and getting answers using authoritative, um, geographies. Okay. I might leave it there, but if, I guess come back to the, the talk, um, a couple of parting remarks. So the goal of Loki is to enable, um, Australia's spatial data on the web. Um, and a couple of things there is that persistent um, identifiers for feature and geometry, which I've shown. Um, there's a separate um, geometry service. So we're handling geometry um, in its own right um, and providing different um, APIs to interface with that. We've got link sets, which are the links between geo um, geographies. Um, and we've got 
um, the Loki integrated API um, and graph cache, which I, I didn't talk about too much, but I can, I can share with those who are interested the technical details. Um, and hopefully I've shown that we can have a GIS capability over the web um, without needing to launch traditional GIS tools um, in this presentation. Um, some acknowledgements. Um, this was a cross-agency, cross-organization effort. So there's, there were many people involved in this uh, project. Um, so I want to acknowledge them from the different agencies. And um, yeah, if you like more information, feel free to reach out uh, or check out some, some of these uh, links on, online. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, there's one question on the chat that um, hasn't been answered by Simon. Erin um, uh, was asking whether the disaggregation that you were showing on the accelerator uh, are features that are distributed across landscapes. Uh, is it just using the Excel data to disaggregate or was it looking at extra dwelling data online? So the, sorry if I understand the question, um, this aggregation from catchments to mesh block. Um, so I guess you, I guess this is a crude way of doing it. Um, we're doing it by spatial area and overlaps. Um, so currently in that particular demonstrator, the accelerator demonstrator, it just uses um, you know, pure spatial overlaps to calculate the, you know, the reapportionment from one feature to another. Um, we are in discussion with um, Data61 and there is a project called Your Data, Your Region, which has a more sophisticated um, statistical covariate approach to doing that sort of, this, you know, redistribution. I wouldn't, wouldn't say disaggregation. Sometimes you're aggregating and, and um, disaggregating. Um, um, so that distribution of um, values using um, covariates. So if you load in a community profile covariate set, then they can calculate, you know, the 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 distribution in a more sophisticated way. So um, we hope that in the future that those those two products can kind of converge and provide, um, you know, so Loki providing the authoritative geographies and your data, your region, providing that capability to do that disaggregation and aggregation uh, in a more sophisticated way. But yeah, this was a demonstrator showing what you could do with it. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I was just trying to clarify, yeah, what was happening with the, the disaggregation, whether it was fundamentally looking up some information and, and returning to that previous state with the high resolution, or if it was, as you just explained, yeah, sort of spreading the data out across the landscape using some mathematical model. Because um, I think when you first sort of went, okay, we'll go from mesh to catchment, and then we can go from catchment to mesh, then in my mind, I was like, is that going to create the same data like when you were going forward and backwards? So, no. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks. Is, is there any other questions? Hi there, it's uh, Rob Atkinson. Hi Rob. Hey John. Um, one thing you uh, didn't really mention, um, maybe it was implicit but could be made explicit, is uh, pre-calculation of uh, relationships is often necessary because there are sometimes complex issues. And I know, for example, if you're looking at uh, matching um, objects defined uh, at federal and state level, they often have quite different ways they handle coastlines and estuaries. And you know, some of those things are really not trivially easy. You have different resolutions, simple polygon analysis to work out stuff. So the ABS has always published correspondence tables where this stuff has been gone through with a great deal of expertise and care and vetting. Mm -hmm. um, so the technique of pre-calculation is well known, but um, what's being offered with uh, persistent web addresses backing it up is the ability for people to find whatever pre-calculations have been done. Um, and that was not, no, that's a new mechanism which didn't exist before without the persistent web addresses. So 
there's often yeah. it may leave people cold. Oh yes, of course you could do that, but what you couldn't do before was actually find if someone else has done those pre-calculations in a scalable way. Yeah, is that a fair enough assessment of one of the, one of the key issues here? Yeah, I guess I guess it's the it's one of the fundamental things that you mentioned, Rob. Like, firstly standardizing the location identifiers and I mentioned standardized linkages. I didn't go through too much of that, but you could imagine different link sets for different types of pre-calculations. We've pre-calculated based on a spatial overlap um, and intersects and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's a night, what that, that is one process, but you could have a different, you know, process that has a, has a broader kind of community adoption or, or kind of vetting. Um, and that's an alternative option as well. So yeah, I guess you could have a catalog of link sets, which we do um, and broker that, um, broker that querying um, based on the user needs, you know. So following that up from the perspective of a community of practice, um, uh, the the registration of link sets plus other data which is attached to these objects is necessary at a community practice level in order for people to be able to share because if you try to centralize all that information and the management of it we don't have any agencies with that mandate so it doesn't scale so has there been any update on the thinking about um, how the community of practice would share such information um, so there's been quite a bit of um, discussion about governance of Loki. And so um, we have been trialing a um, governance body based on the, the partners in Loki. And so um, the mechanisms haven't been ironed out yet, but um, it's, it's kind of informal at the moment. Um, so um, GA are, um, have a, have a email address that you can get in touch with if you'd like to register a, a data set or if you'd like to register a link set. Um, and there is a bit of a process about um, evaluating, you know, the business case and then the technical, um, uh, you know, technical requirements for getting that into Loki. Um, so yeah, it kind, kind of sits with um, GA and the, um, I think they were calling it the Spatial Location Authority, SLA. Um, so that's being prototyped in Loki, the Loki project. Um, but I wouldn't say there is a um, stringent um, policy or whether there is a um, you know, recommended governance approach at this point. Um, we're, we're, still, we're still trialing things out but happy to engage with the community to you know, bring on board new data sets and advise on how to publish uh, spatial data on the web aligned with Loki. Right. Uh, and Rob, I think that's a really good suggestion of how does the community practice engage in that activity. So probably something that we can take off time as well. Um, we're before, uh, Quick, one more, one more quick question. Uh, is there any other questions that anybody wants to ask? All right. Um, so thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for the session. It was really useful. I found it useful. Um, there's also a link on the meeting notes to the GitHub or uh, for the Jupyter notebooks that Jonathan was showing. So if anyone's interested, you can find them on the meeting notes. Um, so, uh, and I'm sure if you've got, anybody's got any other questions to follow up with, uh, Jonathan will be happy to take emails and, and ask the, answer the questions. Um, right, um, so with that, that brings us probably to the end of this session. A couple of other things that uh, we wanted to mention. Um, Michael, did you want to talk, uh, introduce the uh, e-research session? Yeah, sure, Karen. Um, so next week we've got e-research uh, conference, um, which is uh, moving, moved across obviously to an online format and um, should be a great event. 
and the community of practice was actually lucky to get the birds of a feather session in there um, and the birds of a feather session that we'll be doing is unpacking the mapping the spatial um, data and services landscape activity that we did a couple of months ago now um, with the mindset to really um, drill down and figure out what the requirements for this may be um, and what a registry may be like if we were to move in that direction. So a bit of requirements capture. Um, the other part of the BOF um, is going to be looking at what are some of the future activities um, which will come out of that activity, um, the mapping one that is, um, in towards I guess the future of the spatial um, uh, geospatial community practice into I guess next year and looking at what are some of the key items that we could uh, look at uh, in that space. So um, the, the actual birds of feather session is going to be held next Monday, the 19th of October um, at 12.20 for those who are attending the e-research conference, um, it's on there. For those who aren't, registration is really affordable. Um, if you'd like to still come along and see some other exciting um, presentations and activities like the one that we'll be doing. Um, otherwise, um, the working group, which will be formed out of this, will be kicking off more formally around about early to mid-November at this stage. We had a couple of delays um, in September, which sort of pushed things back. Um, we're looking to kick off the working group more formally later on. But um, yeah, birds of further session next Monday um, and getting some ideas for the future. All right, um, so I think that wraps up uh, this session. So thank you everybody for joining and um, hope to see many of you at the e-research session, if not, uh, the, set, uh, the next one after this. Thanks, Karen.